is the most dangerous volcano on Earth. It's in the southern part of Indonesia, in a small island called Tambora, not too far away from Australia. And this is the reason why this is the most dangerous place on Earth. And on the 8th of April, 1815, let me repeat, 8th of April, 1815, this is what has happened the biggest volcano eruption ever recorded, and multiple times more powerful than the one of Pompeii. The flames, the smokes, the debris went 20 kilometers high. 60,000 people died. It was a colossal proportion. In fact, this has also effect in the climate. And the summer of 1816 became famous because it's called the year without the summer. It was really atrociously cold. In this very summer, a group of English, British writers and philosophers called the Romantics decided to spend their life, or this summer, in Geneva. Let me introduce you to them. The first one, Lord Byron, probably the quintessential Romantic writer. He had a kind of a rough time because he got a divorce a few months earlier. The second one, William Polidori, a doctor, Italian origin. He was a personal doctor of Lord Byron, but he had a passion of writing. That's really what he wanted to do. The third one, a couple, two fiancés, Percy Schelling and Mary Schelling. This group rented this beautiful place called Villa Deodati, which is a very nice place close to Geneva in a place called Corogne. And they probably thought they would have enjoyed summer taking a stroll by the lake, having fun. But that's fundamentally what they found. It was dark, it was cold, it was atrocious. They even got some snow, and the snow was brown, gray, because of the ashes of the volcano. So one night, they organized a dinner, they started drinking French wine, actually better Italian wine, and they made a bet. And the bet is, who would have been able to write a horror story, a scary story? Now, Lord Byron was a bit distracted because he got a divorce a few months earlier and was kind of confused. William Polidori was very enthusiastic and he wrote a story, a racconto, called The Vampire. That was then used uh, years later by Brian Stokes to write Dracula. But the one who won the bet was Mary Shelley, and she wrote Frankenstein. Point is, this is not Frankenstein. Frankenstein is a doctor called Victor Frankenstein. He is the one who invented the creature, and for the entire book, Mary Shelley doesn't give a name to this. In fact, he called it the ugly beast, the awful creature, the thing. In a way, it's kind of strange that you write a book and you don't give a name to the main character of your book. Why she's been doing this? She's been doing this because she was concerned about this. She wrote this book at the peak of the first industrial revolution. So she was concerned about the social and the human impact of the first industrial revolution. She really was. And her point is, are we becoming a monster? Are we becoming an ugly creature? Are we losing our identity? Are we losing our identity? And that's the reason why she's not given a name to Frankenstein or to the monster. So the first revolution occurred, the one about uh, uh, the start in, the, in England uh, 20 years before Frankenstein was written. The second happened, the one of electricity. Then the third one, the one of computers and data. And right now, we are at the beginning of the fourth industrial revolution, about 
artificial intelligence, machine learning, algorithm, robotics. And the difference between the first three and this one is not only the speed, it's not only about the mass production, the cost, it's about this change in us, it's changing me and you, it's changing the way we relate to each other. Therefore, we need to pause for a second and consider if the frame that we use to understand complexity is the right one. So, I want to play a little game with you. Can you please close your eyes and imagine the map of the world? Close your eyes, all of you. Imagine the map of the world. Now, open your eyes. Is this what you've seen? No? Anybody from Australia? Yes, okay. Did you see that map? Yeah. No, sorry, I went to see too many Bruce Springsteen concerts in my life. So, uh, <laughs> and uh, my wife, she's desperate about this. But here is another way of looking at the world. So we really have to consider if the way we look at the world is the only one that matters, is the only one that counts, or can we see the world in another way? So, this guy, Frankenstein. Frankenstein is asking us a few questions. The first one, what are we learning? What are we learning? And the best way to explain it, I'm going to give you a little story. This is called Sakazuki. It's a Japanese word that explains this object. This object is a cup that is used during the ceremonial tea in important occasions. And in 1963, the government of Japan has decided to give this as a gift to everybody who was 100 years old or more in Japan. In 1963, the number of people 100 years old was only 150. And last year, they realized there are more than 30,000 people age 100 and more in Japan. So they probably will stop giving this for free because it's too expensive. Now, what does it mean? That when Frankenstein was written, in 1816, life expectancy was on the late 30s, or early 30s. Since then, progressed by two and a half years per decade. Right now, it's on the late 70s, with Italy and Japan and Greece on the top of the league. Now, by 2060, it's gonna be more than 100. It's gonna be more than 100. So can you really think of a life where we go to university, we stop studying around 24, 26, huh? and then we're gonna die 100, and we have 60 or 70 years in front of us. Can we think of a life where we will continue learning for our life? And in order to explain this, I want to introduce you to one of my heroes. Most of my heroes are women. Her name is Inge Rabenport. This picture was taken in 1937. She's about to graduate to become a doctor. One of the most happy days of her life, but she received a letter saying, we do not want you here, get out. Why? She was Jewish, and they didn't want her. So luckily, she decided to emigrate. She goes to the United States. She had a very successful career, and in her 50s, she returned back to Germany. She opened a clinic, and she became a very famous pediatrician. And sure enough, she retires when she's about 80. Three years ago, the University of Hamburg, they realized what they've done. And they say, damn it, we've done something terrible. Let's see if she's still alive. And miraculously, she was. And I told her, would you like to come back? You prepare a thesis, and you get your graduation, and you finally become a doctor at the University of Hamburg. And this is Hinger. She's 102. <laughs> and God bless her, she's still alive, 105. The second question from Frankenstein. Which choices are we making? Which choices are we making? And this is a picture of kids celebrating birthday. I have a daughter, she's 11 years old. She does a lot of this stuff, pretty much every Sunday. And you can see there is a cake in the middle of the, of the picture. And you can imagine that by the end of the party, a mom and dad are coming, they're cutting the cake in different parts, and they're going to give us slides of the cake of all the children. Now, let's assume for a second, still a good party, and then a mom and dad comes and give 90% of the cake to one child and 10% of the cakes to everybody else. Do you think that the kids will probably have fun? Not much, huh? 
Well, that's exactly the party that we organize in the world, where 90% of the people get 10% of the wealth and vice versa. Is that fair? No justice, no peace. Here is a good example of artificial intelligence because with driverless car, they will decide who's gonna die in a car accident. In the first example, it's gonna be the people crossing the street. In the second example, will be the people in the car, the passengers. And, and artificial intelligence is already deciding right now what you're buying when you, when you look at Amazon or this kind of thing. So who's gonna be recruited? Who's gonna get a loan? Who's gonna get a job? And perhaps sometimes in the future, who should we get married or maybe divorced? Should we really reflect uh, and while embracing technology changes, retaining the ethic of our decisions? And the last story and the last question from this guy, or oh, it's the same one, what is our moral compass? And I want to tell you a story of another of my hero. Her name is uh, Ngozi Iwaela. She's from Nigeria. I worked with her for many years when I was at the World Bank. She's one of my heroes. She left the World Bank to become um, Minister of Finance in Nigeria in 2010. And then she started fighting a very corrupted system, which I'm afraid is not only pertinent to that country, as we know. So she said, you know, Paolo, when, when you go through this fighting corrupting system, you're gonna go through different phases. One, they attack you. Two, they attack you even more. And if it doesn't work, they will attack and try to take your family. She told me this on a Tuesday, and on a Thursday, they kidnapped her mother, 85 years old, and said, if you don't resign, we're gonna kill her. So she called her father, and she said, what are we going to do? This is the most difficult decision of my life. And her father said, what is our moral compass? What do we stand for? What do we stand for? So from this story, I've learned two things. First of all, had I done this with my mother, she would have killed me, okay? So don't do this with Mama Gallo. Second, there are moments in life, there are moments in life where it doesn't matter what you studied, you cannot download a formula or a video, you just stand alone with your values, with your ethics. So, to end this year, I've gone since Mary Shelley, wrote Frankenstein. And I still believe that the questions from this guy are still very relevant. Have we learned something? What choices are we making? What are our moral compass? What do we stand for? And allow me to add another question close to my heart. Can you imagine what we'll be able to do if we were not afraid? Now, I want to close with a confession we're close to the Vatican, so it's per per pertinent, okay? I don't have the answer for you. I won't give you the answer. Because I'm absolutely convinced that if you look into your heart, you will find it there. Thank you. <laughs>